Buen Camino Pilgrims, and welcome back to the Sacred Steps podcast. My name is Kevin Donahue, your host, author of Sacred Steps, a pilgrimage journal. On today's episode, we're talking to pilgrim, backpacker, and author Sandy Brown. Sandy's written several guidebooks on pilgrimage, including the Camino Frances and the Way of St. Francis. Today, Sandy and I will be talking about some of our favorite pilgrimage routes, including the Camino de Santiago and the California Missions Trail along America's Pacific Coast. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Sacred Steps podcast, Sandy Brown. Sandy Brown, welcome to the Sacred Steps podcast. Great having you on. Fabulous. It's really nice to be here. Thanks, Kevin. Absolutely. Um, Many pilgrims know your work uh, and service through the pilgrim community and the community forums uh, and also from the Cicerone books. Uh, But I don't know if everyone knows your pilgrim backstory. So could you tell us a little bit about your past pilgrimage walks? Absolutely. Well... Kevin, I, I mean, in about 1992, I read Paulo Coelho's book, The Pilgrimage. And after reading The Pilgrimage, I just kind of put it on what we didn't even at that time call a bucket list. And I said, I've got to do this sometime. And part of the reason is my own background from Mexico and from Latin America, where my family is from, and partly was my spiritual background, too, as a pastor. And the kind of mix of magical spirituality and Spanish culture really hooked me in reading the pilgrimage. And so then in 2008, when I had the opportunity to actually have some time and do the walk, I did it. So I set out in May of 2008, and it was fabulous. And after walking on the Camino Frances of the Camino de Santiago, the next year I sent my younger son so that he could experience it. And then the next year was 2010, the holy year. So I did the uh, part of the Via de la Plata. And the following year I did the Frances again, and clearly I was hooked. Pretty soon it was Italian pilgrimage walks, and then it was writing guidebooks. And it is a little bit more than a hobby, and not maybe quite uh, an obsession, but it's definitely something that I find extremely enjoyable. And if I were, I mean, if I were in Spain or Italy right now, I'm sure I'd be walking, even in this crazy winter weather that we're having. Well, and it's been quite a challenge for pilgrims this year as well with the onset of COVID and and really just so much heartbreak and, and suffering in Spain and through Europe. Are you regularly in touch with anyone who's in uh, in Spain right now and, and getting updates from the Camino? Yeah. And- yeah, yeah. I'm in touch with some folks in Santiago as well as along the route itself. And then my sister, who collaborated on the accommodations piece of my Frances guidebook, uh, she's in touch on a daily basis with albergue owners and operators all across the Frances. And then also in the Italian walks. And I think everybody's equally having a difficult time. We'll discover, I think, when we're on the other side of this, that a lot of the albergues that we have loved the most will be out of business. Or if lucky um, for us, they'll be under different ownership that allows them to be able to survive, although the previous owners maybe weren't able to make it happen. And... It's all it's just kind of a piece of the worldwide problem that we've had in this pandemic. And, uh, and so we're way down the food chain. I mean, essentially, this is 
walking for recreation and spirituality. And the, the way this has affected so many aspects of life is just overwhelming. And I hope when everything gets back up to gear, that we'll be back on board and we'll experience some of what we were able to experience over these years. Uh, great point, Sandy. Well said. Um, you come to pilgrimage from uh, an interesting background. You um, were ordained in the Methodist Church. Um, and I think you shared with me previously some of your um, background and family background really inspired um, you know, you to walk. When you're on pilgrimage, how are you um, staying connected to your faith? Well, I have different ways of doing it. And on the Camino Frances, there's one special way that I do it as a Methodist slash Protestant pastor. And that is when I go into a church, I look for an artistic representation of St. James of Santiago. And that's funny that it becomes a sort of entree into the spirituality of the people that built the church or the people that worship in the church. So I may find it in a stained glass window. I may find it in a statue. Uh, you know, I may find it in a mosaic. Uh, I may find that I'm a little bit appalled by what I see, which is Santiago Matamoros slaying some Islamic people. And, um, but to me, that's the first connection. And that opens up the Camino from a biblical standpoint, because James, of course, was a biblical character. And I have a particular connection to him because uh, I played James in a passion play that my community put on in Fall City, Washington. And so I always think of it from this perspective of James. And, uh, and he's more, he's one along with Peter and John and Thomas of the disciples slash apostles that get the most billing in the New Testament. So I look at it from the standpoint of St. James. And I see it as being about his story. And I look for him along the way. And I begin a dialogue with him in a kind of cathodist, methodic perspective <laughs> where combining Methodism and a little bit of the idea of the saints and at least the cloud of witnesses, which is a biblical uh, un concept, and combining all those into an entree into the spirituality of the Camino. Now, Kevin, you haven't told me your Camino experience and how you got started in walking pilgrimages. Yeah, well, thanks. And, you know, frankly, I think if I'm being completely honest, Sandy, I didn't set out to walk a pilgrimage. Um, I think I was one of many on the Camino who was looking for a life experience and uh, maybe a greater connection with what um, I would call like a quasi-spiritual uh, connection and a point in my life where this was a more of a bucket list thing. And, you know, like you, I, I grew up in the Methodist church, but um, uh, I was a little lapsed, um, but listening, I think. And I did the Camino Portuguese in 2019 and really didn't expect that I was making a pilgrimage. I thought I was making a life-affirming experience in, with great people and, and great culture. Um, what I found along the way was a lot of what we carry right with us um, can't be measured in your backpack, right? And as I was walking through um, and meeting pilgrims and having an opportunity to be in um, different cities and towns every night and going into different churches, like you said, and finding a connection. Um, I really found more purpose in my Camino and found that there was a true spirituality um, that resonated with me. And by the time I got to Santiago, um, and you probably remember some of your first Camino experiences, um, I was, you know, 
I was physically broken. I was <laughs> mentally <laughs> exhausted and I sure. was, um, spiritually laid out. And, um, at the end of my journey to the cathedral in Santiago, um, there was everything that I was walking for that mattered in my life. There was my family um, that met me at the cathedral and there was my faith. And, you know, I, I say in my upcoming book, I was a very reluctant pilgrim. And I think my faith journey is, is as clouded as many might be. But um, I really, really didn't set out to become a pilgrim. And I think maybe along the way became one. So... Um, oh, interesting. Thanks for asking. It's a really, it's a really awkward story, and I don't know that I've shared it before. So, uh, thanks no, for the question. Cool. You and yeah. I, um, speaking of connections, you and I first connected um, as you were preparing to do the California Missions Trail on the Pacific Coast, and I had um, planned to do the Missions Trail uh, in 2020 and uh, COVID intervened. And ah. as a payback to the community and Butch uh, and several of the ladies and gentlemen from the California Mission Walkers Facebook group, which is a great group. If you're thinking about the California Missions Trail, definitely get involved with that group on Facebook. Uh, and yeah. I, that's how really we got connected. And I set out as a thank you to the community and I transcribed some of the, the books about the trail and the stopping points into some GPS uh, routes. And you kind of took it from there. And this year you did the California missions walk. Um, yeah. And yeah. as you go through um, on the, on the trail, I think I would love, because I haven't been there uh, on that walk, maybe share a little bit about your California missions trail experience this year. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, Kevin, for putting together the GPX tracks for the Mission Trail. I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> and I'm pretty amazed that you did it so accurately with just the guidebook and Google Earth and a tracking program. Um, because I often found that your tracks allowed me with great accuracy uh, to find places that um, people on the ground were having a hard time with. So, for instance, when I was crossing the Dunbarton Bridge across the bay, trying to get there on the bike trail was kind of tough. And there was another guy that was trying to find his way on his bike. And um, I said, just follow me because I've got <laughs> Kevin's tracks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think like many people, I was disappointed that there was not the possibility to go to Europe because I've gone to Europe virtually every year since 2008 um, and done a pilgrimage walk. So this year that wasn't really a possibility. And I was aware of El Camino Real. I was aware of the California Mission Walk. And I started to dig into it. And when I researched it, I came across your GPS tracks. I came across the Butch Briary book. And I said, maybe I'd do that. And then there was just a period in the summertime when I said, I'm having a hard time just sitting around the house. Yeah. I'm going to do this. And I decided that I would do it on an electric bicycle. And uh, at the time, it was hard to get e-bikes at all. So I bought the only bike within my budget that was going to be able to be shipped to my house in Edmonds, Washington in one week's time. And I, I, I then got on the train and went down to California to do the walk on a bike. And um, it's kind of funny because the e-bike made a difference about how I approached it because I thought that my maximum range was going to be about 40 miles. And it turns out if I kept the pedal assist on level one, that I could actually go about 60 miles. So sometimes in my planning, I had only arranged for 25, 30, 35 mile distance. So it ended up taking me about 50% longer than it needed to. But that also gave me the time to um, have fun with video on each of the days. And I just in the spur of the moment decided that I was going to videotape it. So I brought a little bit of gear. I brought my camping gear. 
And then I taped going down on the train. I taped getting to the walk and I taped uh, all the way along. And every night I would edit my tapes on um, my iPad and load them up to YouTube. And sometimes it took me until midnight to be able to do that. But I had such a blast with it. And then I came away with a lot of respect for El Camino Real and how it is, as I have called it now, America's up and coming Camino. Because in my opinion, it has the structure, it has the basics that would be needed to make it a genuine Camino of international significance. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done to build the infrastructure and some basic figuring it out. Because right now, you know, less than 100 people have actually uh, completed the California Mission Walk per se. And that's not many people. And uh, I mean, it demonstrates some of the obstacles around it. For instance, at one point, there's a 75 mile or so stretch that has no services except one store. Well, how do you walk that without some sort of help? And the California mission walkers can give you that kind of help. But I think most pilgrims are looking for a place that they can do, say, 15 miles at a time with inexpensive lodging. And there's a gap between where the California Mission Walk El Camino Real is now and that kind of goal. And it'll take some years to uh, flesh it all out. But in the meantime, it's a great experience. And the star of it all, in my opinion, is California, which I fell in love with again. And I was born in California, but my family moved to Seattle when I was seven years old. And then going back, it's like, why wouldn't everyone want to live in this state? It's so great. <laughs> so. Oh, but yeah. So um, if, you, if you're just popping in on the podcast real quickly, let me give you a reset. We're talking with uh, Pilgrim backpacker and author Sandy Brown, uh, associate publisher at Cicerone Press. Uh, and we're connecting uh, about our pilgrimages earlier and also talking about the California Missions Trail, which Sandy completed earlier this summer. Um, and Sandy, I want to ask you another question about California, um, El Camino Royal, Real. Um, the path that California takes, kind of, you go through three of the largest cities in North America. And I'm curious, having done pilgrim routes uh, throughout Europe, you know, and then popping into this modern experience, what that contrast is like on a day to day basis for a pilgrim. Surely there are some conveniences, but uh, I'm interested to learn your perspective of how that um, enhances or even colors the experience for the California Missions Trail. Sure. I would say that there really are three completely different urban experiences in the walk. Now, San Diego is one of the big three on the walk, but most of the trail through San Diego is on bicycle trails and along the beaches. So you don't really go through downtown. You don't really see much in terms of the suburbs, uh, bike trails going primarily then along Mission Bay and up, um, up toward Mission Valley. So that's the easy one of the urban experiences. The one in San Francisco is actually, for much of it, quite pleasant because San Francisco is so beautiful and you're actually going downtown. So that's the most urban of the experiences because you go right up Market Street and uh, alongside the cable cars and things like that up from the Embarcadero. And, you know, that's world class cool. Uh, and so, yeah, there are services along the way so you can get things to eat and so on. That's good. But there's also kind of the joy of seeing San Francisco. Then after you get out of the urban area of San Francisco, and of course I'm thinking north to south, so with that caveat, then there's a long suburban stretch as you make your way out Mission Avenue and then through Redwood City until you get to the Bay. 
that's all suburbs. And that is much more similar to the Los Angeles experience, which is the other of the three urban settings. It's a little surprising that it takes two full days on a bicycle to get through Los Angeles at an average of about 50 miles a day. So the I was shocked to realize that the greater metropolitan area of Los Angeles is about 100 miles to get through. That's really amazing. That's a megalopolis for sure. And what's interesting, I never quite understood about Los Angeles is the difference in the neighborhoods. So Pasadena is actually quite an upscale neighborhood, and you go right through that. And then you go through some much lower income neighborhoods. So uh, Mission San Gabriel is in a lower income area, basically, and somewhat Mission San Fernando as well. And strung in between those are some neighborhoods that are, um, I would say, not troubled, but just sort of low income and uh, not scary, just not as prosperous as some place like uh, Pasadena or San Marino, which is one of the most expensive of the Los Angeles neighborhoods. You don't go through downtown Los Angeles at all, which is a little bit of a shame because if you went through Malibu down toward Long Beach, it'd all be beautiful oceanside. Instead, you go through the urban or the suburban area in order to hit those two missions, which are closer to the hills. So um, I would say that the experience is noisy, sometimes uncomfortable, uh, monotonous. And uh, if you've ever walked the Camino Frances, it's as though everything were that stretches are entering Burgos uh, on the north side of the airport, or as though you're leaving Leon. So Camino Frances programs will understand what I'm talking about there. And um, so it takes a certain preparation to be able to handle that. On the other hand, if you're going through Oak Valley and then the Salinas Valley in the stretch between King City and Bradford or San, Mission San Miguel, it's isolated there's solitude, there's quiet. As I'm riding along my bike, I would see coyotes out in the um, cow, um, the ranches. And the coyotes would stop and look up at me like, what's this suburban what's this bike here? <laughs> <laughs> and they look with great curiosity, but they wouldn't hear me until I was right on them. And then I was like, what's going on here? Uh, because they know that, uh, you know, I'm 30 or 50 miles away from anybody else. And that's a big, big surprise. The other piece of the topography is that you spend a lot of time near the ocean. And that's fabulous. Oh, my gosh. That's, that's maybe like the coastal path on the Camino Portugues. But it's not like... Even the Camino del Norte doesn't have that much coastline. So I think that is world-class and unbeatable and spectacular. Yeah, incredibly picturesque, right? If uh, yeah. We're talking about the California Missions Trail. If you want to know more about this path, uh, I'll link it in the show notes, but definitely jump on Sandy's YouTube channel. Uh, as he said, he made some daily recordings, and I'll put the links in the show notes, but you can definitely experience it. And if what you see resonates with you, um, I think um, weather permitting, COVID permitting, travel permitting, um, Sandy may be able to help organize a California Missions Trail bike experience for you and others uh, next spring. So be looking at his website, Caminoist.org, for that as well. Uh, Sandy, the California Missions Walk um, traditionally follows St. Sarah's roots as California's missions were built, um, flowing from uh, the south of the state uh, at San Diego. And as 
the Spanish made their way up the coast, ending in San Francisco. Now, you actually took the route uh, in reverse, starting in San Francisco and making your way from the last mission sequentially down to the very first mission in San Diego, which is a bit of a different way of looking at that experience. But um, I, I, I heard in your videos you saying that that was a really great way to experience it. And I'm just wondering uh, if you could tell us a little bit about kind of taking a traditional path and, and experiencing it in reverse a bit. Yeah. Well, um, I think I'm right. And I think the best way to do the California Mission Walk or El Camino Real is from north to south. And there are a couple of reasons why. First of all, bikers who bike up and down the California coast know that the prevailing winds are north to south. And so they consider it an oddity that somebody would be starting in the south and going to the north because they're fighting the prevailing winds. Uh, another thing is that some people believe like when you do the Pacific Crest Trail, you start in the uh, spring in April and you start uh, from the south and you go north because you're trying to get north before the snows fall in the Cascades. And you've got about six months to do that. They're gonna, it's going to be impassable after um, about mid to late September. So the Pacific Crest Trail goes south to north. But the California Mission Walker, El Camino Real, does not have the threat of snow. And so there's no Pacific Crest Trail related reason to go from south to north. And then St. Sarah, indeed, he started in Laredo, California, and walked to San Diego. But he only got as far as uh, Carmel. And he may have gone up, I think, in fact, he did go up to San Juan Bautista. But as far as I know, he never made it to San Francisco, to Sonoma, or to San Rafael in the far north. So the standard way of doing El Camino Real is either south to north, or it's north to south to Carmel, and then south to north from San Diego to Carmel. But I think that if a person starts in the south and they go north and they end up in San Rafael or in Sonoma, what they end up with is the least connected to the history of the missions in California. At San Rafael, there's hardly anything that reminds a person of the actual mission that was there. And that mission was just an outreach really of the San Francisco mission. And then when you get to Sonoma, the Sonoma mission, I forget the exact years, but it was opened in something like 1820 and then was closed in 1834. So there's only 14 years of history. And it's a state park. It's not a church. So there's not really the spirituality that you would find at most of the other missions. So I think that somebody walking south to north is ultimately when they get to Sonoma going to be a little disappointed in what they find there and at San Rafael. So I think the depth of the experience starts to kind of fade the farther north you get. So that's just the opposite if you go north to south. Because if you start in Sonoma, you're starting at the least uh, at the least amount of history. And as you walk south, you get into more and more history until you get to the San Diego de Alcala mission, which is the oldest of the California missions. It's a beautiful building. There is an active church that worships there. There is a longstanding uh, connection with its history as a mission and a whole community around it. San Diego is a lovely place to end a, a walk or a bike ride. So I, I, uh, I think I'm right. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the way I reckon that, uh, that I recommend doing it. Perfect. Well, thanks for that perspective. And I, I agree. You've, you're Sandy Brown. You, you know what you're doing here. So um, Sandy uh, has the entire video series on his YouTube channel and more details at his website, CaminoS.org. Uh, this is the Sacred Steps podcast. We're talking to author and pilgrim Sandy Brown. Um, 
He has published a couple of guidebooks, uh, The Way of St. Francis um, to Assisi, and also a great guidebook on the Camino Frances. And so I'd like to take just a moment and talk a little bit about your Camino experience, uh, Sandy, and um, get some of your insights. Um, You've walked multiple routes along the Camino de Santiago, and you have detailed in your video series all of the different routes that pilgrims can take. I'd like to know if you have a favorite route on the Camino de Santiago. Yeah. Well, I'd have to say that the Camino Francis is still my favorite. So um, I've walked it or biked it four times now. And I recommend the Francis as a first Camino for people. In fact, I'm going to ask you in a minute why you chose the Portuguese as your first Camino. But I know that there are issues around overcrowding, concerns about that on the Francis. But what I like so much about it is a very clear division between the, the sections. So as they say, in the first third of the Francis, you're building your body. And the second section of the Camino Frances, the Meseta, you are worrying uh, and working on your soul. And in the third stretch, you are thinking about your future and, and where God is taking you in your spirit. So I think that's all true. And also there is a very much still present connection with the archaeology and actual buildings that were there during the 12th and 13th century when the Camino Frances was at its peak. So if you do the Camino del Norte, you have almost none of that because by the time the Norte, um, uh, by the time the Frances was built, the Norte was already falling out of use. And uh, so there's almost no connection with things like pilgrim hospitals, uh, you know, that are eight centuries old, like on the Francis. Just the numbers of people meant that the infrastructure that was built 800 years ago is still visible in many places. And that's important to me. And it's also true that the documentation, of course, with the Codex uh, Calixtinus, uh, shows the historicity of the route. And that's a little bit more conjecture with some of the other Camino routes. So I like the historicity of it. I like, I actually find that it's a positive thing to have the high number of pilgrims that are there. In fact, just uh, in 2019, as I was biking it, I just wanted to make a quick trip to confirm some details of of my book before it was actually published. And so I set out on a bike and I found myself magnetically being drawn to other pilgrims. And I didn't want to lose them by biking ahead of them. And so I always kept kind of accidentally taking longer than I had intended to until I couldn't do it anymore because of my time restrictions. But to me, that's one of the real uh, joys of the Camino, meeting other people. So if you're on one of the Italian walks, or if you're on one of the lesser Caminos in Spain, you won't meet as as many people. There are benefits of solitude. That's a cool thing. But there's also a benefit of camaraderie in an international pilgrim community that picks up with you and moves along for weeks. So I still have a Camino family that I meet with and visit with uh, from my 2011 Camino. We're strategizing now about getting together for a 10-year reunion someplace in Europe in 2021. And uh, also, I I have my reservations for July 25th in Santiago de Compostela for uh, Santiago Day. So uh, I also love the uh, Del Norte because of the coastal walks. Um, and the one that we don't often think about is the Camino Santa Brace, which is goes through the Santa Brace region of Spain. 
And there are some beautiful and quiet walks along that way. And it has its own uh, connection once you get into Santiago. So that's a lovely walk as well. Wonderful. Um, the Camino de Santiago is probably, you know, it's a cultural phenomenon. It's probably the best known um, Christian pilgrimage, at least. And there are some people who are sitting at home and um, have been tested during this global pandemic and are probably thinking about making um, a pilgrimage on the Camino de Santiago. And I see behind you, uh, you have your cellos and, and uh, your Compostela. And, and I see, you know, from your very first uh, pilgrimage there in the background behind you, that means a lot yeah. to you and, uh, and you've kept it and framed it. Um, what, what draws people back to the Camino time and time again. You've done it several times and people return to the Camino time and time again. What's the draw uh, of the Camino and um, Santiago de Compostela specifically? I imagine that for everybody, it's a little bit different. Um, I've already mentioned the importance of community on the Camino. And in my life, I've only had a couple of experiences of that intense kind of community over many weeks. The other big example for me was when I was doing my doctorate in a residential program. And I had to fly there and spend weeks with the other doctoral students in a fairly confined space. And that ended up being pretty fabulous. So I think one, one reason why people want to go back is the community experience. But I would toss out that there is another thing as well. And that is that the walking experience in particular is a, a sort of a vacation of the soul for a modern person. So what I discover after I've been walking for a week or two weeks is I'm walking along a road in a city and I hear a car go by and the sound of the engine of the car is offensive to me because my ears are used to being out in the farmland or in the forests. And so I, I hear the sound of a car and it's like, I can't believe that it's upsetting and annoying to me because I hear that all day, every day in my normal life. And so being in a walking pilgrimage and being away from things like cars, and also I really recommend people don't bring your radios or your headphones because you're just repeating the same experience that you have back home. Leave those things at home or use them just at night. Listen to the sound of the world and the sounds of nature. Listen for bird song. Listen for uh, the rushing of the wind. Listen for cowbells and for church bells. And when you hear those things, you are hearing a, a kind of life that is more common to people from all of the ages past. And that's part of the pilgrimage experience. If you bring your headphones and you listen to your favorite music, you're entertaining yourself and you're bringing your old normal life into the pilgrimage experience. In a way, you are coloring it with modern colors and missing part of it. So I think it's a sensory experience where we are deprived of modern living and the sounds of it. I think we also uh, find that in terms of possessions, because you have everything that you need for, say, a month on your back. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting here at my desk and I've got two computers and I've got pencils and papers. And I've got cameras and then there's a TV over there and there's a file cabinet and there's a kitchen. And if we are to take the weight of my house and put it on a scale, it'd be like, tons and tons and tons of things my garage is full of stuff <laughs> but i prove on the camino that i can get along with less than 20 pounds of things in fact 
if I have 15 pounds, it's even better. And so it's also an experience of being deprived of for a time of modern life. And there are some not so great things about modern life. And if you can have a vacation from it, watch as your soul expands and you begin to understand what life is more has been more like for the people that came before us than for us who are surrounded in a cloud of noise and material possessions. So, well, let me ask you, you walked the Portuguese. Yes. And not the Francis. And you walked in 2019. What led you to the Portuguese? Uh, You know, frankly, researching the different routes, um, I had just found your Camino Francis guidebook, which was incredibly detailed. And I was looking at all of the different routes and I found some information about the the Santiago story. And as I was looking at the um, retelling of the St. James um, story, the connections to um, locations along the Portuguese route. And as I started looking into it, that was really interesting to me, the historical connection or, you know, the details um, as we know them today of the historical connection to St. James in Padron, um, where his body is said to have arrived um, following his martyrdom um, and, and returned to Spain and really walking those paths Um, I was very interested in following the Roman road as it made its way up, um, Roman road 19 and kind of following that route into Santiago. And then I also, quite frankly, wanted the connection along the coast. If you follow the Camino Portugues, uh, you have two options. One is along the coastal Portuguese route, uh, either continuing up into coastal Spain and making your way a bit northwest. Um, The other is to cross over at some point, uh, and I chose to cross over along the river separating Spain and Portugal. And I grew up in a little small town on the river, and I actually fell in love with um, Villanova, uh, Serviera, and um, Valenca, as I was going up the um, river separating Portugal and Spain and found that there was a great connection to my own childhood experience uh, in taking that route, cutting over to the uh, Portuguese Central and then up through uh, Tui and Pontevedra and Padron and on into Santiago de Compostela. So for me, the Portuguese is fantastic because you get a little bit of the authenticity of the region. You have the opportunity to experience, you know, a couple of different languages right away. If your Portuguese is not good, uh, you've got Spanish to fall back on and both of them speak a lot of English. So you're always going to have a great experience as you go through the Camino Portuguese. Um, But I also wanted the opportunity to connect really to some of the Spanish uh, lore and the history of um, the St. James story. Um, and, and really, I think for me being able to visit the monastery there in, uh, Padron or outside of Padron was, uh, another fantastic experience that drew me into the Camino, but also drew me into myself and helped to reconnect me with my faith story. So in total, I would say it was the right Camino for me. And I'm not sure there's a wrong Camino for anyone, but, right. um, yeah. you know, I think we find the Camino that we need uh, a bit. And I'm excited to go back, of course. Um, in the interim, I think there's a long list of things that I have ahead of me. Um, but I wouldn't trade that Camino experience for any of them. One of the Caminos I want to do, you actually write about in your guidebook for the Camino Francais. And that's continuing past 
Santiago. So a number of pilgrims um, continue on to essentially what is known as the end of the world. And if you've seen, for those of you who may be watching this and thinking about the community, if you've seen the movie The Way, you see uh, Tom, who is making his Camino pilgrimage and the Martin Sheen character, and he's encouraged to go um, to Santiago and then encouraged in the movie to go to Musia. Uh, you actually detail one of the most exciting and picturesque Caminos, which is you continue from the Frances to go to Finstera. And I'm wondering uh, if you could tell us a little bit about the journey past the cathedral to the end of the world, because that is certainly a Camino experience that not every pilgrim gets to gets to enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's pretty lovely. And what's kind of nice about it is that you get to experience Galicia with, I mean, if you've, if your only experience of Galicia is on the Camino Frances, then it's very populated with pilgrims and it's uh, constant trinkets and baubles that you can buy in stores along the way. And it feels a little commercial. But after Santiago de Compostela, it quiets down. And I would say it's something under 10% of people that head on on foot to Finisterre. Uh, there are just, you know, every 25, 30 miles, there are a few albergues, but nothing of the quantity because the number of pilgrims declines so quickly. So I recommend that people walk first to Finisterre and then on to Mushia, because if you do that, then you walk along the coast and uh, the towns of Corcubion and Say are really very beautiful little towns along the coastline. And of course, Finisterre is as well. So um, what you get is the experience of eucalyptus trees, walks through forest, the walk through very green farmland. There is the Celtic aspect of that all, you know, because uh, Galicia is one of the, uh, you know, one of the regions of the Celtic sphere of influence. So there are historic Castros and things like that along the way, as in much of uh, Galicia on the Camino Frances. But uh, it's also generally a uh, wet Camino because Galicia is wet, but it's also warm. So you're unlikely to find um, snow if you walk on from Santiago to Finisterre or Mushia. The towns are very different. Finisterre is larger. It's still not a large town. Um, and when you go out to the lighthouse and you get to that marker of kilometer zero that you see everybody has their pictures at, then you're about probably 200 feet off the water and you look out from the top of a cliff, essentially, out toward the sunset. When you go to Mushia, there's a long and very low peninsula after Mushia, which is a uh, quiet and modern town, fairly modern, you know, very few ancient or medieval buildings although it was Celtic and Roman, just like Finisterre. But you walk out on this fairly low peninsula and you see the sunset from maybe 10 yards height. And you can go down and dip your toe uh, down off the boulders or onto the beach. Um, you know, it's just a few yards away from where you would see the sunset. So very different experiences. I find Mushia to be windy. And I find Finisterre to be a little bit better protected from the wind. So they both have their advantages. And at the end of a Camino walk, some people want to have a quieter town like Mushia. And, um, and, and there are fewer pilgrims there. There's about 10. Now, I think a taxi driver told me there's about 10 times the infrastructure in Finisterre in terms of albergues and hotels and such. And just a little uh, professional tip. If you want the most fabulous place to stay at Finisterre, then look for Hotel Semaforo. And that is the hotel that is right by the lighthouse on the tip of the peninsula beyond Finisterre. And they have only about a half dozen rooms. 
But if you stay overnight there, you'll experience the Cape Finisterre with the lighthouse, the light going round and round. And you'll be one of only a few people with a pretty spendy and fabulous restaurant underneath. And it's really a, uh, it's one of the great hotel experiences that very few people know about or do uh, to stay right there at the Cape overnight. It's not cheap, but I'd rather do that than spend a night at the Parador in Santiago, in my opinion. Wow. Great endorsement. So uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. See, I've, I'm learning something new every every time we're getting together. Uh, if you just joined us back, we're talking to uh, Pilgrim Backpacker, author, guidebook writer, Sandy Brown, associate publisher, Cicerone Press. He handles their Camino and pilgrimage uh, books. And so definitely check out, I'll link in the show notes below, his two guidebooks, the Camino Frances and the, the Way of St. Francis Across Italy. Um, previously, we talked about the Camino de Santiago. We talked about the California Missions Trail. We talked about what drew us to pilgrimage. And this is the part that I've been waiting to talk to you about, Sandy, because I want to talk to you now about the Via Francigena. And uh, this is actually my upcoming pilgrimage. Uh, you have a new guidebook coming out in 2021 for this route from the um, Canterbury Cathedral in Kent, England, across Europe um, to the steps of the Papal Basilica of St. Peter in the Vatican. So for those that aren't familiar with this epic pilgrimage, introduce our listeners a bit, if you will, to the Via Francigena. Absolutely. Well, epic is exactly the right word for the Francigena. I think it is just an extraordinary walk. And having spent a lot of time on the Spanish Caminos, I think that the Francigena is a great next step for people that want to have a different kind of adventure uh, to go out over a longer period of time and see more diverse cultures. So the beginning of the Francigena um, for history is really with the walk of Archbishop Sidgwick in the year 990. Sidgwick was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he wanted to get to Rome to get his pallium, which is his uh, mantle of authority from the Pope. So he walked with his retinue to Rome, uh, you know, going across the English Channel through what was then France and still is, and then up over the Alps and into the various different small kingdoms, which are now Italy. And he made it to Rome, and then he came back. And either his secretary or he recorded the actual stops along the way from Rome back to the English Channel. And so that gives the itinerary for the French Indian. In reality, for three or 400 years before that, people had been walking from the British Isles to Rome already. And there is a Roman or an Anglo-Saxon community in Rome uh, around Santa Maria, not very far from uh, what is today the Vatican. And uh, many different Irish and Anglo-Saxons are known to have walked that route like Bishop Fridianus, who was Bishop of Lucca in the 7th century, but he is from Ulster, Ireland. So uh, what it looks like now is a 2,000-mile network of trails and secondary roads that begin in Canterbury and then go all the way to Rome. And it generally is about 90 days in length, and... Um, 70 to 90 is what most people say. And um, so it's really, I think you could break it down into parts based on the countries. It's about two days from Canterbury to Dover. You can walk it in one day. It's a little bit more than 30 kilometers. And then you get on a ferry. Right now, the ferries aren't accepting foot passengers. So you have to find somebody that's willing to drive you in their car onto the ferry and then come back. And hopefully that'll change very soon. Then you get into France, and it's a pretty flat part of France as you go um, toward the um, Reims area, through the Champagne area, 
and through the Marne area where there were some important World War I battles. Then it begins to get hilly, and it's hilly all the way on through Switzerland. And by hills, I mean mountains. But uh, as you're leaving Switzerland, you're actually climbing to a pass uh, in the Alps, which is the great St. Bernard Pass. If you've ever heard of the dogs, St. Bernard dogs, that's where they come from. And St. Bernard Pass is about 8,400 feet in elevation, so it's quite high. There are only two months of the year when you can cross it on the pass, on the footpaths, and that's August and September. And then you come down from the pass into Italy, through the Aosta Valley, through the Piedmont area, then on to the Po River Valley, through Lombardia and Emilia-Romagna. Then you cross another mountain range. And this other mountain range is the Apennine Range. You cross it, go to the coast, and then you head back through Tuscany and Lazio into Rome. So um, those all just sound like names. But in reality, every one of those names has its own history. Like when you get into Italy, the Aosta Valley is part of Italy that speaks French as well as Italian. And uh, when you get into Lazio, that's an area that was dominated by the popes for the last 1500 years and everything in between. So uh, it's quite the epic route. There is a good infrastructure of pilgrim accommodation from the top of the Great St. Bernard Pass to Rome, but it's a little more difficult to arrange through England, France, and Switzerland. So it's common to begin a Franchigena at the Alps and then go to Rome, just because it's a little easier due to the lack of infrastructure before that. You have to be something of an adventurer to do it through France, uh, because there are long stretches where it's best actually to have a tent and a camp stove and a sleeping bag, because um, you're challenged with the distance and no accommodation in part of the way. But it is doable. Many hundreds of people do it every year, although not nearly as many as do the Camino de Santiago. Some people say about 20,000 or so people do uh, all a part of the Via Francigena every year. That's incredible. Um, of course, you've been on many parts of the Via Francigena uh, as a pilgrim and as a guidebook author. Um, and, and you just mentioned some of the ways, the length, the infrastructure, that this is different from the Camino de Santiago. Are there some favorite elements of this route that you can share with people who might be interested in making this pilgrimage? Yeah. You know, I just love the Alps. Yeah. And uh, the experience of starting around Lake Geneva, which is in the drainage of the Rhone River, and walking up, uh, it ends up being about 5,000 feet elevation to get from Lausanne to the top of the pass. You cover that in about six days. But walking up that is just spectacularly beautiful. And um, these are areas that are not frequented by many people in the summertime. Uh, they're recreation areas with all the ski lifts in the wintertime. But there are some great trails on either side, because actually, as it turns out, on one side is Mont Blanc, and on the other side is the Matterhorn, and the Great St. Bernard Pass is just in between. But that experience of walking up the pass and then walking down is pretty spectacular. And there's nothing like that on, the, on any of the Caminos in Spain, because Spain's mountains are just not that big. There's some skiing in the Pyrenees, but that's a lower, older range than the Alps. So that's a piece of it. Uh, I think also the changes of cultures. There are many cultures on the Camino Frances because uh, Navarra and Basque country is different than um, La Rioja or than Castilla y Leon, which is different from Galicia. So there are three or four. But there are a dozen nameable cultures 
in the 2000 kilometer stretch of the Via Francigena that each are pretty special and precious. So just starting with Canterbury Cathedral, that itself is a pilgrimage destination. I mean, Canterbury Tales by Chaucer is about people walking to Canterbury. So, uh, and there are other pilgrimage destinations of their own, of their own importance all along the way that connect. You also walk through some Protestant territory, which is kind of unusual because the French part of Switzerland is a reformed church. So the cathedral at Lausanne is actually a Protestant cathedral. And many of the churches that you see in Switzerland are Protestant churches. So that's kind of fun for a Protestant Methodist style person, uh, you know, from the U.S. So that's a little bit of a difference as well. And I don't mean any insult toward the Spanish, but Italian food and the joy and the care <laughs> that is given to the making of Italian food is pretty spectacular. And if you have only had Menu del Peregrino on a pilgrim walk in Spain, or maybe in Portugal too, then when you get to Italy, you'll be overwhelmed with the uh, culinary choices that and the love that's put into their preparation. Oh, I love that. Thank you. See, there's something to look forward to uh, that uh, maybe isn't uh, the big note in the guidebook. Um, let me ask you some quick questions about the route. You tell me the first thing that comes to mind as we talk about your experiences there. So you've mentioned a few of the segments, but just quick answer. What's the most beautiful segment? Now, I want to tell you two. One is the Alps. And you can't really dispute when you're standing at 8,400 feet that Great St. Bernard Pass is spectacular. It's surrounded by granite peaks, jagged granite peaks. But there's also nothing quite like being in the Apennines and being on the crest of the mountaintop just at Paso de la Chisa. And you're at the same level as the summits of the other Apennines around. You're by yourself. You may, in the distance, see a wild horse. They actually have wild horses in Italy. Okay. And um, it's different just being on the top of a mountain. That's pretty yeah. spectacular. So I think those are the two most beautiful places. Okay, fantastic. You mentioned the Alps, and you keep saying the Alps, and that makes me a little nervous, frankly, about walking the Alps. Um, so I'm hoping you have a different answer. But what's the most challenging segment uh, on this pilgrim route? Well, you'll be delighted to know that by the time you get to the Apennines, uh, you'll be in great walking shape and you'll just go right over them. Perfect. Those are a little bit more difficult because there's not as much um, infrastructure available to you. So there's a 30-kilometer stretch between Berceto and Pontremoli in the Apennines that I consider to be the hardest stretch because it goes over Chisa Pass. and um, But the thing, as you look at um, crossing the Great St. Bernard Pass, is that Bourg Saint-Pierre is only 17 kilometers from the top of the pass. So you have, even if you're completely out of shape and climbing that about 3,000 feet is hard for you, you still only have 17 kilometers to cover. So you can do that in four or five hours, no problem. But the 30 kilometers from Barchetto to Pontremoli uh, are a real challenge because you have that much to climb up and down. And you only have one uh, hostello, which is off the trail two kilometers, that's available to you for housing. Uh, a couple of other places that you can say too, but just the one hostel. So I would say look ahead for that and then be prepared for it. By the time you've walked, you will have already walked about 1500 kilometers. You'll just do it in such a breeze. It won't even be a problem. <laughs> okay. So I have that to look forward to. Uh, you mentioned uh -huh. some food that's going to draw me to Italy. Of course. Um, yeah. I've been cautioned. Some people miss um, taking the route through France and, um, 
You spoke about it a little bit, but is there a don't miss aspect to the route through France? Well, I only know what I've read because I have walked twice from Lausanne to Rome. And I should tell you, by the way, my guidebooks that are coming up are a three-part series. And they'll be Canterbury to Lausanne, Lausanne to Lucca, and Lucca to Rome. And so uh, my walks have been for volume two and volume three so far. But on the French side, I am very intrigued by some of the towns. In particular, I love the great Gothic cathedral. So I'm looking forward to being a Reem. I'm looking forward to the World War I cemeteries. And uh, if a person wants to read up on, on that, some of the best description that I've read is actually in uh, the book Via Francigena uh, by the uh, New York Times author. I'm forgetting his name right now. His book is right over there, Timothy Egan. Timothy Egan. Yeah, yeah. And Timothy Egan's description of his walk through France is really pretty fabulous, I think. And uh, I think that's the best of the travelogues that I've read about it. Yeah. Um, so a lot of us can't wait to get our hands on your new guidebook. Um, and I can't wait to begin walking from the Shrine of St. Thomas Beckett at Canterbury Cathedral. Um, my pilgrimage is actually going to start from Southwark Cathedral in London and follow a bit of the traditional pilgrim's way through England. Uh, connecting Rochester and some of the historic routes. There's so many pilgrimage routes through England, um, yeah. probably 75 or 80 or more. Uh, but I really want that opportunity to get to Canterbury and begin my journey. So tell me, when is your guidebook coming out? Uh, when can Cicero Press get it in my hands? Uh, and when can we expect that uh, next year to be uh, available for sale? Well, the three volumes have two different publication dates. So volume two and volume three will be published this coming spring. So you should have them in your hands on uh, in March of this coming year. And then volume one, I still have to research and write. And so I'm thinking, or I'm not thinking, I, it's scheduled for publication actually uh, in January of 2023. So I will, COVID permitting, I will walk it in 2021. That's the one thing I have on my COVID calendar for next year, on my walking calendar, that's a must. I'll write it in early 2022, and it'd be produced in late 2023 for a publication. I'm sorry, late 2022 for a publication in 2023. So what's your schedule for your walk, and am I going to miss you? Well, COVID willing, um, and I think that's really the caveat for everything we talk about right now of making international travel to Europe. But um, I plan to be in England in April and uh, walk the Pilgrim's Way. And yeah. um, you, you know, Greg's willing. That, by the way, that hey, hey, listen, I've got it sitting right over here. Uh, so <laughs> very excited to have it. Um, I, if I make any notes along my way, I will definitely pass them forward to you as well. But I can't That's wait great. to start that. So um, once I get to Canterbury, as you said, going straight uh, to Dover and then over into France to begin my pilgrimage. Um, my so plan, you, yeah, yeah, my plan right now is to to try to see if I can do it in one go. But you know, sometimes life intervenes in our plans and. Um, you know, man plans and God laughs. And I think there are opportunities like that, um, that I'm really looking forward to the sort of the, uh, you talked about the opportunity to have your own tranquility and to really have introspective introspective moments along the Camino and along a pilgrimage route and the solitude um, of the Via Francigia is is a great opportunity for that for me. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah. We've been talking uh, on the Sacred Steps podcast with uh, author, pilgrim, cyclist, 
guidebook writer uh, and all around uh, Pilgrim legend, Sandy Brown today. Sandy, I want to thank you for joining us. If you've missed any of our segments with Sandy Brown, uh, we discussed a few of the historic pilgrimages, including the Camino de Santiago. We talked about the California Missions Trail. We also talked a little bit about what draws us to pilgrimage. So please do give them a listen. Um, Along the way, we've talked about some links and some highlights. I'll put those in the show notes down below. So please click those so we can find uh, Sandy's website at Caminoist.org, his uh, guidebook series on the Camino Frances and the way of St. Francis to Assisi, uh, as well as his upcoming guidebook, uh, which we now know will be the 2021 and maybe 2023 publication. Um, So uh, Sandy, it's been wonderful to have you Uh, and just really appreciate your wealth of knowledge, not only that you've shared with us today, but so much that you've given to the Pilgrim community. Thank you so much, Kevin. The pleasure today has been all mine. And I want to say Buen Camino to you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to saying uh, Buen Camino to you as well. Maybe seeing you along the way as we go. Uh, yeah. This has been uh, Kevin Donahue, the Sacred Steps Podcast. I'm here with Sandy Brown. Sandy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Sacred Steps Podcast. On our next episode, we're traveling to the UK to walk virtually alongside author and backpacker Andy Bull. Our English audience will recognize Andy's name as a columnist for the Times and Telegraph. And his latest book, Pilgrim Pathways outlines 20 walks that can be enjoyed on a weekend along England's ancient pathways. We'll also be discussing my upcoming pilgrimage trip through the English countryside, the Pilgrim's Way, from London's Southwark Cathedral to Canterbury Cathedral. If you're interested in making pilgrimage through England, Scotland, or Wales, or looking to learn more about my upcoming steps, please click the subscribe button below so that this episode will download automatically to your phone. Until next time, be well, stay safe, buen camino.